In September of 1620, 35 saints and 67 strangers set sail from the port of Plymouth on the coast of England. Their goal? To establish a second permanent English colony in North America. These were people primarily defined by their religious identity. They were Puritans, um, which was a term that meant that they were trying to purify the Protestant religion in England. They felt that it had not sufficiently uh, broken with Catholic precedent, that there were too many ceremonies and uh, too much of the church hierarchy that had been carried over from Catholicism. They were increasingly in conflict with the king and with the upper hierarchy of the church, the bishops and the archbishops, who didn't think that the church should make any more changes, that uh, it had reached just the right level of reformation. And they then proceeded to try to purge the church of these Puritan elements. The group had been granted permission to settle in northern Virginia, but when they arrive at Cape Cod instead, outside London Company territory, they draw up a document to legitimize their position before they leave the ship. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually, in ye presence of God and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic, and by virtue hereof to enact laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions and offices from time to time, as shall be thought most meet and convenient for ye general good of ye colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. It isn't long before other Puritans decide to risk the voyage. Especially uh, after the mid-1620s when there was a new king, King Charles I, and some new archbishops who were hardliners about trying to suppress Puritanism. Many Puritans in England thought that they needed to get out. The people who embark on these journeys are quite different from those who signed on for passage to the Chesapeake. People have, in fact, analyzed the ship lists, and, uh, and we know a lot about the early settlement patterns, what towns they went to, what, what little patch of land they lived on, and so on, uh, and who they brought with them. Because New Englanders, the colonial New Englanders, were nothing if not committed to keeping lots and lots of records. The dominant group in the migration would have been families with parents in their late 20s, 30s, even early 40s. That's to say, people of some substance and maturity. Uh, they were people who owned some property, who owned their own farm or their own shop back in England. And so we have much more of an, uh, an age spectrum, from children to young adults to even old people who are going together as intact family groups. They're going with uh, some property of their own. They're paying their own way. Some people crossed um, because they were drawn by the prospect of cheap or free land. Some people were drawn by spirit of adventure. Some people were disappointed and went back. But the majority of New Englanders were sort of self-selecting Puritans who wanted to establish a godly community in the New World, the kind of community that they had tried and failed to establish in the Old World. People often say that the Puritans came to New England because they were being persecuted in Old England. There's an element of truth to that, but many people in England might have said that the Puritans left because they had tried and failed to persecute everybody else in England and that they now wanted to persecute others in North America. If you looked at that, you would find large numbers of people who came with a congregation, uh, maybe not everybody in the congregation, but a fairly a big subset of a church in England would come, would travel together, and would settle together. And that's one reason all you have to do is look at the place names of New England and compare them to Old England to see a lot of that kind of uh, uh, continuity. And then, of course, there's the word of mouth. People writing back, uh, people, who, the people who are, in effect, the kind of advanced scouts. Um, we're here. It looks good. You should come over. Uh, there are people who write and say, I have never been so miserable in my whole life, and I wish I could come home. As an Englishman studying early American history, I think it's very important to recognize that when people crossed the Atlantic, they didn't sort of dump all their cultural baggage overboard. They were very much Englishmen and Englishwomen living in 
a new world, and that new world transformed their lives in many respects, but they still, in many other respects, remained a product of the culture they had come from. So it's important for us to understand the culture they came from and the way in which the various attitudes and structures that they brought with them gradually, but only gradually, transformed and adapted in these very different circumstances. But rather than thinking of the colonists as Americans, it's in some ways more helpful and, and perhaps more revealing to think about the interaction between their identity as English men and women and their experiences in this very different environment, which then remade, reconstituted their Englishness, their Europeanness, in very fascinating ways.